It was sort of just rain all the time, but not sort of torrential rain. It was just raining for days and days. You know, never having experienced anything like that, the, the assumption was, you know, it would just stop and things would be fine again. But that wasn't the case. We were told we had no problem, that the dikes would hold. They were built by the Army engineers, and we didn't have to worry about the flood at all, just go to bed. I mean, there were still people, you know, down in Corning at that time, and the river was right at the top of the levees. And I think that the alarms were sounded in the community at sort of 4 a.m. or 5 a.m. When, when the water was about to go over. Unfortunately, a lot of our neighbors slept through this process and a number of them drowned. The disaster that happened was something that was none of us could have imagined ahead of time. Our glass side of guard had a walkie-talkie and he was able to, as I remember, communicate with the state police that there were 17 people and two dogs on the roof of the glass center and the water was continuing to rise. It was not too long after that that a state police helicopter appeared. Main Street, the whole of Corning area was just completely underwater. There was no town, it was all river. You know, everything downtown was pretty much gone. The waters receded very fast. They were only up 18 hours, but it was the next morning. I remember actually having an argument with one of the National Guard people because he was able to go down into the community and I wanted to get to the museum. I was very concerned for the library collection because it looked from the edge that that was underwater and uh, I must have gotten in the building about nine o'clock the next morning. I just can't describe to you how it looked because it was such a disaster inside. The, the main galleries, there was four inches of mud on the floor, on the walls. There was display cases that were really not anchored down and they had fallen over. All of the museum workroom, the offices, the library, everything had been under five feet, four inches of water. Every place we looked, there was damage and, and disappointment. staff loved the museum and it was it was devastating to to see what had happened to it and to wonder how are we going to get through this i remember walking up uh, the pathway and running into tom beekner who was the president of the museum and uh, tom said we're going to open august 1st and i said that's only six weeks from now said, I'm not going to stand for having people drive by this museum for the next two years, seeing it covered with plywood and being a sign of defeat. I think the reaction was, was similar to other Tom Beekner proposals. It was, this is totally impossible. But, you know, he led by his force of personality, and so you just worked as hard as you could. We took it as a challenge, and we all worked, because it was important to our morale to get it open again and not just sort of give up the way things were. The goal seemed unachievable at the time because there were so few of us. And uh, that was when we learned that volunteers would be coming in to help. We were very fortunate because a number of other museums sent staff members to help us. It was an emergency. It was, an, it was a conservation emergency. And conservators and volunteers were brought in from literally all over the world. Everything had to be cleaned from the ceiling the walls, the carpet, carpeting had to be totally removed, floors had to be scraped clean. Uh, we even put a couple of small uh, backhoes in there with scrapers and scraped the mud out of the floor by the shovelful. The glass cases were still there with the glass piled haphazardly inside because the water had risen inside the cases and then come down again. So when the cases were opened, it became a, a real challenge to get in there and remove the pieces, which were sometimes tumbled over and lying on top of one another, and get them out without breaking them. There was a, a case that, of Persian glass that was a special exhibition, and that one had actually fallen forward, and the covered glass had broken, and some of the glass had broken under it. So some of the pieces of that were mixed into the mud. 
eventually what they did is they had to take all the mud and pass it through sort of strainers, like in an archaeological site, to strain out any fragments. Pieces that were, had been originally glued together with a water-soluble adhesive, of course, fell apart in the water and had to be painstakingly reconstructed. So every piece had to be handled with really great care and examined meticulously. I wasn't interested at all in the cases and the glass. I just went on. I wanted to see what happened to my books. The library was damaged much more than the glass. When these books got wet, they swelled. And to walk through the library and see all these books just, just in such bad shape, it was like hundreds of deaths all at once. The librarians had heard that the thing to do after a flood was to freeze all the books. You freeze them in order to keep them from becoming mildewing moldy. And then you decided later what to do with them. If we had not frozen the books, think what would have happened. They would have been moldy, they, the paper would have disintegrated, the, the bindings would have fallen apart. So by freezing a library that has been moistened, you buy time. We would snatch the book off the shelf and put it in a box and make a notation on where it had gone. Some of them went up to a freezer locker in Watkins Glen, and they would share space with wedding cakes and trophy game fish. It was sort of a surreal experience to go up and visit my books and push, push a big fish out of the way. It, it took a few weeks to, to actually determine how you could take each different type of book apart safely and you would have questions, but as you know, there was always someone there to help you and uh, pretty soon you knew everything there was to know about taking books apart. Everybody worked to get the museum in party perfect order. Winning day was uh, really quite a happy occasion. Uh, it was the first time that uh, anyone wore nice clothes. <laughs> when people walked through it, it didn't look like a disaster had happened to it. And we were all very proud about that and we were very cheerful about it. For tourists who were coming to Corning for the first time, the evidence of the flood in the museum wasn't visible at all. We had a lot of temporary walls and partitions up, so that, uh, we blocked off everything on the lower level, just a walkway for visitors to get in and out. So the, superficially, it looked great. If you looked in the back rooms, you might, might have been sort of hair racing. <laughs> and that captures for me a lot of the flood. It was a mixture of these horrible projects touched by a lot of optimism that people had that the museum would be moving forward and, and things would survive. <laughs>